Hello, everyone, and welcome to this morning's briefing at the Jerusalem Press Club. I'm Talia Dekel, CEO of JPC. Yesterday's Supreme Court ruling to strike down the basic law that was to cancel the reasonableness clause made waves in Israel, putting one of the most divisive issues in the country back in the headlines after the three-month lull created by the ongoing war. To, de to be determined is how the government will respond, uh, should it choose to focus only on managing the war and its immediate repercussions, and how the Israeli public will proceed from here, uh, still licking its wounds from October 7th, but also painfully aware of our internal strife. To discuss this, JPC host Knesset member Merav Michaeli, head of the Labor Party and former transportation minister. Hello, MK Michaeli, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Uh, yesterday, you wrote that this ruling is an answer to all those who wish to demolish Israeli democracy. Can you elaborate this uh, on this for our listeners, please? To begin with, the fight um, over this uh, legislation was defined as actually, even though it's it's um, as if it looks as if it's something minor, it is very, very prominent and very profound uh, to the structure and to the resilience of our democracy. So people took to the streets in hundreds of thousands because of this cause. And um, the, the country is torn because of that. So once the Supreme Court had the, I don't wanna even say the courage, but um, really kept its integrity and um, disqualified it, then yes, it is a victory for our democracy. Because let's remember that as minor as it may have seen or may have been presented by some, the political will behind it was to allow the government much more power, much more ability to do whatever it wants. Now, in I think especially to um, our audience, our current audience this morning, it's very, very important to notice that it has a lot to do with the war and even more than the war itself, uh, the day after the war. One needs to keep in mind that the number one motivation of the right wing and especially the extreme right and the settlers who are pushing the right wing in Israel, uh, their main motivation for this coup that we were fighting for the last year is the occupation is what's happening in the West Bank. They want to be able to do in the West Bank whatever they want to do without having the Supreme Court, which was the last barrier, um, stopping them from doing so. And in um, canceling the uh, probability or the, um, not the probability, the, sorry? Reasonable. The reasonable, it's, um, uh, standard, they were, on their way to do this, they were unwilling, unable to do it. it we need to notice that um, the fact that the split that is, is really close, even though there's a bigger split, I mean a bigger uh, majority for saying that the Supreme Court is, has the authority to disqualify basic laws in Israel, which I don't think they saw coming, but this very small majority of eight versus seven uh, goes to show, I think, a lot who was appointed before Ayala Chaked was uh, prime uh, minister of uh, justice in Israel and who was appointed after. So we can also see this, of course, in America. The appointments to the Supreme Court are very, very meaningful, uh, of course, to the outcome. So in that, in that case, Israel is saved so far by still having um, enough judges who were there as judges and not as political appointees. Uh, so if we look at the government itself, like in the short run, what can you do about that? First of all, as long as they have Benny Gantz, on the government, they are committed to only do things that are related to the war and that are agreed upon. This is not agreed upon. Gidon Saar came out a few days before that saying very clearly, 
he will not support trying to pass this or to delay uh, the ruling on this and so forth. Uh, Benny Gantz came out yesterday relatively late saying something like, let's not do anything that is not uh, consensus at the, at the moment. So I don't see them um, being able to move this forward at this time. What does it mean uh, about the future? This again is part of the big entanglement of Israeli politics um, these days. So we'll we'll get to the big entanglement uh, in a bit. <coughs> and really, I'd, I'd like your insight on you know how this will impact uh, the relevant parties. Uh, but beforehand, if we if we put our focus back on the war, uh, some journalists are asking how this um, this will impact how this decision might impact the war in several uh, several places. Um, the first question is about Israeli society at large. Um, you know, we've seen a lot of pushback, uh, even from uh, reservists saying that you know they're they're dealing with their their own uh, own uh, efforts in Gaza, and there's a lot of camaraderie uh, that is you know has a has arisen during the war. Uh, from between soldiers of, of all different political opinions, um, and you know how how this is supposed to reflect on them that when they are busy fighting in the trenches per se, uh, the political the divisions are are arising around them. Um, what can you tell us in response? It's too soon to tell, but my sense, my feeling is that it will not affect this camaraderie that you are describing, and. But generally speaking, I think the public is not so uh, bothered with that. People are dealing today in like three months almost into this war, into so many hardships. The atmosphere in Israel is so harsh. Everything is painful. People are really taking very personally the dead soldiers every morning, the hostages situation, our um, challenges in the world, the fact that anti-Semitism has risen its head the way it has um, outside of Israel. So I don't think this is really very high on people's priorities, as well as people, of course, who are actually fighting Hamas in the trenches. So I don't see the ruling itself as something because it, it hasn't really changed as much as the right wing government is trying to portray it as some kind of uh, um, big step. It, it hasn't really changed the fact that this is in dispute, but the dispute to begin with is something that the extremists and the people um, in government are much more engaged and troubled with than the majority of Israelis, even those who in principle support uh, this revolution that the government tried to do, uh, it doesn't really affect their lives on a day-to-day -day basis. So I don't see this affecting the general public uh, in these days of war. If it goes again, if the government takes it um, a step further and we see the protest come back and we see other developments, then yes, it may change the atmosphere again. But the ruling itself, I don't see it uh, make a lot of difference in terms of the civil atmosphere in Israel uh, right now. Okay, so moving from the civil atmosphere to, to the atmosphere, <clears throat> the intentions of our enemies, you mentioned Hamas, and of course we have Iran in, in the bigger picture behind. Um, there were, you know, there were a lot of accusations or not accusations, but there was a lot of talk about the fact that October 7th caught us off guard and that we were so busy with our internal strife uh, that we didn't see what was in front of us. Um, do you think that Hamas or its sponsors uh, will take advantage of any um, any continued division within Israel? Should this be a reaction uh, to the current ruling, even though you just said it wouldn't, but in case it does develop further, do you think that they will they will take advantage of this um, in their modus operandus in the war, which we know is now going to continue for an unknown amount of time? 
Uh, you know, even the IDF spokesperson said last night that um, the dispute in the uh, Israeli uh, society uh, certainly had a big contribution to Hamas's decision to go for the uh, October 7th horrible massacre and um, ferocious attack. We have known from the intelligence, and I have heard this in the uh, committee, and I have heard this from uh, the highest people in Israeli IDF intelligence saying to us before October 7th, during the months in which there was this really painful, and it is a painful um, uh, struggle in Israel against the uh, judicial coup that they were uh, pushing forward. They said, our enemies are looking at us and seeing a historical weakness. They are seeing for the first time in Israel, they said a historical weakness. They warned from this. It's not like we didn't know that Hamas and Iran and others are looking at us and identifying this. We knew that. So in that sense, I, it's not. it didn't get any worse uh, by this ruling. If I mean, I would argue that it, it made it uh, less worse because because at least the structure is still on and it is not falling apart uh, in terms of disqualifying this legislation. But in terms of the social structure, the social um, texture and the forces who have been pushing, they've been seeing this for a year before this attack. So I don't see it making it any like other kind of um, a new degree of it or anything of the sort. Unfortunately, we have enemies who are interested in destroying us from long before this dispute came to be, long, long before that. And they acted on it when they saw an opportunity, but their motivation was there a long, long time ago. And our need and our obligation to ourselves to do whatever it takes to protect ourselves and to make sure that Israel is secure is really regardless of that. Very clear. Um, so mov moving into the political scene uh, itself, uh, one journalist is asking if this uh, ruling could could uh, could help Netanyahu or the Likud in general, which has suffered among its own constituents <laughs> after the colossal failure of October 7th and the fact that at the end of the day, there was a government responsible and at the helm. Um, do you think that the ruling could bring favor back into his court? Mm, this is really, this would be really, I don't know, like looking at a crystal ball. Um, the failure of Netanyahu on October 7th is so, so huge and dire. He, he really has lost the trust of many, many, many Israelis who used to believe in him despite and despite and despite and despite. I don't see even um, some kind of, let's say, anger or resentment towards the Supreme Court or towards the other side um, correcting that loss of, of trust um, from really a, a huge, a vast majority of Israelis and I'm talking about those who used to trust him and who used to vote for him. That said, it doesn't mean that his uh, political um, abilities and his cynicism and his determination to stay in power uh, cannot keep him prime minister. So... How will he use it? I'm sure he'll use it in order to uh, self-victimize himself again. But there's another ruling coming up, and that is on the, um, uh, what, how do you? Fitness for, office. Fitness for office. The legislation that they passed for uh, disqualifying someone from fitness for office, which was designed in order to enable him to stay uh, in office forever. Uh, we still don't know what the Supreme Court will decide on that, but that is, I think for him personally, is more dramatic than the um, the standard that was just disqualified. So 
again, when it comes to Netanyahu, he, he always finds a way to use things for his own self-benefit. And certainly not the country's benefit. Okay, you mentioned uh, Benny Gantz earlier on, and the fact there is still some hope as long as uh, as long as it's a unified uh, government, uh, and and you know if the government continues to focus on um, current challenges and sets aside the reform, do you see yourself uh, perhaps joining this government? Are you even able to, considering the fact that you've already announced that you won't run for leadership of the party in the future? How do you see how do you see that playing out in on a personal level? Um, can you go back to the beginning of your question, please? Yeah. There was some do, do you see here. yourself? I mean, you've already you already announced that you're not going to seek a uh, re-election, at least for leadership of uh, of the party. Um, so, first of all, do you see yourself continuing in any way now that things have changed a little bit, uh, given given the hope that you've already shown, at least vis-a-vis uh, -vis other members of government? Do you see yourself joining the government in any capacity? No. Um, you know, I'm the only uh, head of party from uh, the opposition who've never, um, I'm, other than the Arab parties, who never sat with Netanyahu, never agreed to sit with Netanyahu under any condition, this is not going to change. Um, personally, I came to a point where I felt that my ability to do uh, the things that I believe in and to push forward what I need, what I think needs to happen with the party for the sake of um, the state of Israel, I, I am not able to do what I want to pull out. So that is why I said I will not seek re-election and I will hold primaries. I also said I will not run for a um, seat in labor in the next Knesset. So right now, this is where I am personally, but it doesn't change, of course, my commitment to do whatever it takes to take Israel back to the Zionist course. I know that the, this term Zionism is becoming even more loaded today than it is maybe on a regular basis. But I think it's very important to understand that Zionism was, the original Zionism spoke about equality, it spoke about peace, it spoke about reaching out to our neighbors and our enemies, even in the midst of bloody war days, uh, what the right, the extreme right and Netanyahu's right has made of Israel is something completely non-Zionist. It took out all these major, major uh, fundamental elements of Zionism and replaced it with things that are not only immoral, but also devastating for the state of Israel. So we still need to build a political power which will take Israel back to the Zionist course in order to ensure its future, its existence, its security, and of course, its democracy. Zionism is democracy in essence. This is where we have to go back to. Hopefully the people who are supposed to do that uh, will have what it takes to do it. But I will continue to work for it no matter where I am. Very, very clear. Uh, we just had a few more questions coming in about the ruling itself, if we can go back to that before we let you go. Uh, the first is about, um, and I'm also going to connect <clears throat> to what you just said in terms of going back to democracy. Uh, if you feel that this ruling is now a reflection of of the, um, of, of, uh, of, of what you desire our checks and balance system to be, is are, are we there? Um, is there room for compromise given the uh given given the you know the support that some of the nation had for the reform? Um that's on the one uh one part of the question. And another journalist is asking um what this means about the future of the institution of basic laws given the lack of constitution in Israel. Um, if this basic law can have been could have been struck down, what does this mean about the status of basic laws, uh, whether ones that exist or or future basic laws? Uh, so let me start from that by saying that as long as um, there is no uh, legislation that says how basic laws should be legislated, there's no difference in the way basic laws are being legislated than regular laws. Uh, I think that makes it very clear that they should deserve no uh, stronger uh, defense from criticism. Because if, you know, a basic law can pass with a majority of like, I don't know, 15 versus 14, okay? Which is right now 
the situation in Israel. It doesn't, there is no criteria in the law itself that says that a basic law needs, I don't know, a bigger majority, more than half, more than whatever, maybe four readings rather than three readings, something like that. So as long as that is the situation, it's very clear that it cannot uh, you, you, it cannot claim a stronger defense than a regular law if really it is hurting the constitutional um, democratic uh, basis of Israel and it's being a democratic and Jewish state and so forth. Then what's the basis of the constitutional Sorry. democracy of Israel if there are no more basic, if, if basic laws lose their status, what's left? And I was saying that the Supreme Court has been extremely, extremely careful and not disqualifying. It has actually disqualified very few laws and um, none who were basic laws before. This is the first ever basic law that was completely disqualified. But, um, it, you know, the whole constitutional basis of Israel, the thing, the reason why we still don't have a constitution, the reason why... <clears throat> we don't have the framework for how basic laws should be uh, legislated and so forth is because we have a very deep dispute as for the character of the state of Israel. Is it Zionist, which means um, it believes in inequality, it believes in um, a democratic state and not a religious state, and it believes in a state that has borders and trying to not live in a constant war with its neighbors, but rather um, seeking for agreements and peace with them. And this has been going on for a long, long time. So you cannot, it's not like you cannot, you can cannot separate the content of this uh, very, very deep dispute from the structure of it. And as I said in the beginning, it's crucial to understand that the political will behind uh, these attempts to bring down the Supreme Court and to bring down the justice system, et cetera, et cetera, is such that wants to turn Israel from what it was. It was a Zionist state which strived for equality, for separation between state and religion. For It was a social democratic economy, very much so. And to take it more to a religious uh, um, direction more to the uh, direction that will allow the settlers to really um, leverage everything else in Israel for the hold of the West Bank no matter what it takes and this is what we need to prevent this is what I am committed not only to prevent but really as I said to change the course of as where Israel is going because it really is crucial for its future. Israel, to my mind, will not be able to last if it does not make the choice again, the same choice that made Israel um, a state to begin with, the choice between the whole of the land and the state. This choice needs to be made again, the choice for this two-state solution, to have a border between us and the Palestinians, hopefully a peaceful border as long as it will take. And it's clear that it'll take a long time to build trust between the two sides. But the those who are delusional to think that it's a zero sum game, it's either us or them are delusional. There is no us or them. It's us and them here on the same piece of land. And the sooner we start realizing that we have to find a political peaceful solution to live here together, the better for all of us. And just one last question before we sum up. Uh, one journalist is asking about the future of uh, Israeli-US relations, uh, given the fact that the US, uh, among other allies, were very concerned about the uh, the judicial uh, uh, reform attempts. Um, do you think that this, uh, now that it's been uh, taken down, at least for now, is something that will impact relations with the US um, in the long run, I'm sure all of um, all of Israel's allies and friends who are Democrats and democratic entities uh, are relieved by this ruling. Does it promise that we will not continue to go down that road? Unfortunately, no. Um, as I said, this is 
it, it's not it's not it's not a standalone it's part of the bigger picture of where Israel's going so as I said it's part of the discussion that we have with the U.S. on the day after where are we going where is Israel going and in that sense again the judicial issues and the day after as far as um are we going for a two-state solution or god forbid something that may deter uh, deteriorate deteriorate into a one state or a mess um non-solution is is part of the same thing that will determine also the relationship between israel and the u.s i am one who thinks that the ally that the alignment with the u.s is extremely important for israel it's strategic in many ways and i think israel needs to do everything in its power to keep uh, this relationship keep it because i believe that what the us wants for israel is also what's good for israel according to my view as a leader in israel and this is why i think we should do everything we can to um, make sure that this special relationship remain Okay, member of Knesset, Merav Michaeli, head of the Labour Party, thank you so much for your time and wishing you and everyone else in Israel a, a, a better new, a better year than last. Um, yes, may we have a better year indeed. Thank you so much. Thank you. Goodbye, everybody.